hey, hey, in today's video, we're gonna look at the switchboard. We're also going to do a little tour of our mocap lab. Let's go. So this is our mocap space, and I'll walk you around a little bit here. You've got a 30 camera OptiTrax motion capture system, uh, which we're using to capture motion in our volume here, which is roughly seven meters by seven meters. We've also got uh, one witness camera here set up that records uh, into the volume, captures some reference video. And then down here is a machine rack. Uh, in this machine rack, we've got a few things, including the switch that powers all of those cameras. And uh, we've also got two video recorders. One of them is receiving the, the video from that reference camera. Uh, and then these two, these are some wireless audio receivers. And this is uh, an eight channel uh, Zoom FN8 um, audio recording device uh, that's also providing our time code. So into this we get some room audio, We've got a couple microphones in the middle of our volume out there and it also receives the wireless audio from here. So when we're doing something with an HMC we can mic somebody up and get audio into this device uh, and all that gets sent over to this computer here. This computer has one main job, and it's to run Motive. Motive is the software that comes with the OptiTrack system, and Motive is doing the solve for the body. And we receive the time code into here that gets recorded along with the takes, uh, and it also gets sent down the way into these other computers. So next computer over here. Uh, this computer has two jobs. One of them is retargeting the motion that comes from here onto a character, and the other job is to solve the uh, hand engine uh, role. A hand engine is the solver that goes with our stretch sense gloves, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Down here at the end, we've got two more computers. This one is currently unused, and this one is what we use to run Unreal Engine and do our visualization. Uh, also running here is the hand engine and motion builder doing those two jobs all on one computer and I did that so that we could switch to this web camera and I could talk you through how everything's set up and connected to the switchboard. Our switchboard shows a number of those devices that we've just looked at uh, including up here at the top the two video recorders uh, below that are uh, one iPad and one iPhone, and below that is Motive, and also you can see this here computer that we're, we're working at now, the desktop. Uh, these IP addresses, you may notice, have different uh, domains that they're in, and the reason that we have this uh, is because here at our facility, the wireless network cannot see the wired network. We can't seem to communicate uh, across there, either because of ports or the different domains or something like that. I don't really know the reason, uh, but the wired network and the wireless network can't communicate to each other. So our workaround for that is to use a wireless hotspot. So we have this computer set up with a wireless hotspot, and uh, we have this any wireless devices connected to it, and we can see them here in the switchboard. Okay, so I just connected up my iPad and when I connect this, what I'm hoping to see is this turn green and uh, in order to get that I need to put in the right address. So I go over to my hotspot uh, panel here and I can see that it's got the address ending in 247. And there it is. So that's the iPad Seeing, being seen by this thing. Now with all of these devices green, I should be able to hit record and they should all start rolling. And more importantly, they're all gonna write their data with the same take name. Now I'm gonna do this here, but I noticed when I just did some testing a moment ago that it didn't always work. And I think uh, it's pretty clearly because I'm running so many things on this computer here. But let's try it now and see what happens. Rolling on all the things, now I'm going to cut. Now the 
the switchboard has more than one use case. The use case that we're doing is the one that I just showed you here where we're going to roll on all these different devices. Another use case is to use it to manage an end display cluster, uh, which is a group of computers communicating through the multi-user server. Uh, but we only have this one computer here in our multi-user server. I initially had a difficult time getting the green light on my desktop workstation. And the reason was I was assuming I could start the OSC client somehow from a running instance of Unreal Engine, but I couldn't figure out how to do that. I can only get the green light if I start this using this little icon here, which is running the multi-user server and somehow starting the OSC client. And I, I haven't figured out exactly what, uh, what it is that is uh, starting. Uh, but in theory, I think if you had a running instance and didn't have a multi-user server and could start that OSC client, I think you should be able to get a green light here in the same way that we do with the iOS devices. Now let's look a little bit about how Unreal Engine is set up. Unreal Engine has got uh, a couple of Live Link connections. One of them is coming from Motion Builder. We'll look at that in a moment. And one of them is the uh, iOS devices, uh, the face uh, devices. And in my take editor, I'm recording those two live link devices, getting raw, uh, unmodified live link data here. But I'm also getting how that li the, the results of the application of that live link data on the full skeleton skeletal mesh. So this is live link data running through my blueprint and onto the skeletal mesh and recording all of that. So a typical recording, I'll show you what that looks like. This is something we recorded the other day. We'll go to the take browser. Look at this one. Uh, we're recording the skeletal motion uh, in an animation take here on our character. And here we're recording the raw live link data here. So this is completely redundant, these two pieces of data. Uh, the, uh, we're recording them here in Unreal so that we could potentially do things later like filtering or cleanups or adjustments. And here we're recording the audio that's coming into the computer. Now I've set up this audio in a very particular way because I really wanted aligned audio here in Unreal Engine. So what I've got going on for that is we have this Logitech Bluetooth device. So our performer will use their phone and Bluetooth connect to that device. That will get come into the computer, out of that device and into this computer. And that allows me to capture and record it here. It comes out of this computer and goes into some room speakers and that's how they can hear, uh, everyone can hear that. It also gets picked up by the room microphones in that case and gets attached to our raw body motion down the way on that other computer. So that's how the take recorder is set up. Let's look at Motion Builder next. Motion Builder here is performing the role of retargeting. It's taking our input motions and applying them to our target character. And it's getting the input motions from these uh, devices. This is the Optitrax uh, device that receives uh, motion from Optitrax onto the yellow skeleton. And these are two hand engine devices that get the hand motion from the gloves. Those are applied to this skeleton, which comes from Stretch Sense. And then we remap the motion from the yellow skeleton onto the Stretch Sense skeleton. Uh, which is where the hands and the body motions get merged. And then our character uh, gets, gets the motion from that stretch sense skeleton. So it's a bit of a staged operation. So this is like our assembly skeleton. And then our character skeleton gets its motion data from that. Now I'll go over and start a take so you can see it playing. And I could also wiggle around these gloves and you should be able to see the hands move as well. And there's, there's the hands moving. Maybe I'll leave the left one on. So the hand engine is also running on this computer. This is what it looks like here. There's me 
not quite uh, zipped up properly, but you can still see I'm getting reasonable motion. So this application is a little too complicated to give you, um, you know, a quick overview, but I'll just point out this section here where we're remapping onto the stretch sense skeleton uh, inside here. So it's coming out of this application over these ports and into Motion Builder with the right joint names. And that's what's coming into uh, those devices that we just saw. So one of the things that uh, I didn't point out because it wasn't set up yet is how we're getting time code into Unreal Engine. Uh, so why is time code even important? It's worth pointing out uh, that time code, what, what's the purpose? What's the use? Uh, what's, the, what's the reason? What's time code all about? So time code really is not that complicated. It's just a clock. It's a clock that counts in hours, minutes, seconds, and then frames. Instead of milliseconds, it's going to give you frames. So it really needs to know your frame rate, and it, there's a sub, only a, a specific set of frame rates that are supported in timecode, uh, and it re relates to broadcast standards. So the reason that we care about timecode in an environment like this is because we have a bunch of different devices recording a live event that later we want to potentially reference, and getting them aligned in time is really important and really helpful. And I'll show you first how it's connected to Unreal Engine by setting that connection up. Uh, we are using a particular plugin the, from OptiTrax. It's uh, this one here that's bringing the timecode in. When you enable that plugin, then you get this option to connect to an OptiTrax source. Uh, the only way I've found to connect is to manually type in the addresses carefully because this window goes away. That's the computer that's serving. And that's this computer here. And when you hit create, you get a OptiTrack source type and a status that is connected. And as soon as you do that, over here, you get timecode showing. Oh, well, wait a minute. Oh, <laughs> forgot an important step. So notice here that it's 4.43 and here it's showing the time, the local time on this computer, so it's not currently getting the time code from here. It won't do that until you select this object and you tell it to be the time code provider. And once you do that, you'll see it changes to the time code uh, that's being reported by that computer down there. You could see it's gonna update into the time code that's coming from the currently playing take. So one more really important thing for anybody using OptiTrack and Motive and the Unreal Engine plugin for the OptiTrack to receive the timecode. As soon as you connect to this for as a timecode server, uh, it changes a setting, an important setting, and wrecks all your motion. So the setting here is on the streaming tab in the settings, and it's this one here, skeleton coordinates. It changes it from global to local, and we need it to be on global, so you got to come back here and change it. Now I have no idea why it wants to do this, why it thinks that's a better uh, thing to do when you connect to the time code, but it happens automatically and you got to change it back in order to get your motion back in the global space, which is what we need. This isn't the only way to get time code into Unreal Engine. Uh, another way could be over a live link connection or through a video feed that's coming into um, a video capture card. Uh, but this is the way that we are doing it currently. We may change this in the future to something like a tentacle sync because currently we can't get time code onto our phone devices any other way. Tentacle sync is an option that's exposed in the app uh, and this is a little hardware device that generates time code and you can use it to sync to other devices. It's got some software connection as well. So we're gonna uh, get one of these things in the coming year. We've ordered one supply chain issues, etc., cetera, uh, should show up sometime next year. So that's a little bit about time code and uh, a little bit more about switchboard and uh, a lot about our different devices that we have in here. So I didn't point out this computer. This one is currently doing nothing at all and is ready for us when we're going to embrace the virtual camera. Now, 
We haven't done that because we kind of work in a staged way. One of the uh, factors with having all of these different devices providing some information is that there's a high level of complexity and many points of failure. So there's, there's often one of these points um, that's not working out. Right now, for example, I came back from lunch and Motion Builder is chugging along, not working well at all. So I'll have to restart that uh, to get a good stream. And that's just one example. Motion Builder's regularly doing this sort of thing and I would love to find a way to cut out Motion Builder and do the retargeting inside of Unreal Engine. But that's a bit of a project. Um, but it's something to keep in mind. So with a lot of complexity comes a lot of problems. But I think that's a great place to end. We'll wrap it up there. I really appreciate you uh, joining me on this journey and I do hope you come back. So thanks again.